Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first press conference of the cycling podcast on the Tour de France. Questions in French and English only, questions en français et en anglais uniquement. No questions will be taken on the Anglo-French relationship. <laughs> Thank you, Francois, for opening uh, tonight's press conference. Sadly, uh, this is our first one of the Tour de France. We got stuck last week uh, traveling and so we weren't able to record this but we did this at the Giro we're doing it again here we're taking the uh, questions that you have phoned in you've left messages on our whatsapp number we've got lots to get through so let's just crack on shall we hi chaps I know I'm late to the party and you may not be able to answer my question today but as someone who has taken years to try and get the optimal position on my bike and that has ridden the majority of the Paris-Roubaix route I know the consequences if the bike is not quite set up for you correctly. I find it absolutely amazing to hear in your post Pave stage roundup that teams will have up to five bikes set up for the team leader in case of mechanicals. If this is the case, how on earth do these poor domestics cope with a stage like that with a bike that doesn't quite fit them properly? Well, that was Bryn with a question from the Pave stage. Seems like a long time ago now it's a good question actually because there was a lot of that going on on the on the cobbled stage and you know i guess riders are are matched for bike changes i'm thinking rigoberto around danny martinez on another stage where the, the bikes are pretty similar in terms of size um but it is dangerous when riders change to bike that's not quite the right size for them i mean going way back to 1983 i remember bernard eno in the vuelta um, rode with his saddle at not quite the right height and did, did his knee quite bad damage. So uh, when the body is very tuned to a certain position, it, it can be it can be not great. But different riders adapt differently to those changes. There's a famous story about Geraint Thomas, who's in the yellow jersey here, of course, um, finishing a stage on, on someone else's bike and not realizing because he is uh, he's quite adaptable. Um, but yeah, nice comments about you there, Francois, as well, from Bryn. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I the, the thing is, I don't have to change bikes personally during the, the <laughs> during the tour because I'm sitting at the back of the car in the nest and very rarely goes front. So I'm I'm quite you know adjusted to my seats and uh, even on the cobbles, I you know I feel you're like fine these. on the cobbles. <laughs> I think the, the the sort of short answer to that is that on a stage like that, or indeed in the mountains, the 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 team leader is the queen bee, and the the the, the other bees in the hive um, do whatever is required. Uh, for the queen bee and and if that means riding some kilometers on uh on a on a bike that doesn't quite fit them for uh you know until they can get a, a full bike change then that's what happens i mean you know these things this is a kind of particularly on the cobbled stage the, the kind of craziness and the the logist sorting out those logistics on the hoof it was absolutely incredible to witness mm. on um you know when i was standing out on the on the pave cars were stopping everywhere and riders were swapping bikes and getting wheels and stuff um it's just part of the race i mean they're often not riding in ideal circumstances either the wrong bike or they've got a niggle or whatever that's just the tour there, there, there was an interest re, an interesting remark from the edges to our guys uh, i remember what one well, on one of the stages was on, i don't think it was in the cobbles it was one in the britannic stages when romain bardet had to change bikes and uh, he took another bike and he lost a little bit of time there and actually what i was told was that actually the plan was that you know another right teammate was supposed to stay with him to to change bikes and another teammate was supposed to stay with pierre latour to give him his bike in case of trouble but it, it didn't happen that way because that's the plan you make you at the start but i mean in in the turmoil of the race i mean sometimes it doesn't happen so you take whichever bike uh, you know gets to you and uh, and about the teammate well you know he's only asked to finish the the stage within the time cut and, and that's it. Hi guys, this is Kieran calling from Llangollen, North Wales. My question is about TV coverage. I was watching an old, um, well, an old Lance video back from 2001, I know, shame on me. And one thing I noticed was that the TV coverage in its essence, in terms of graphics and information, was pretty much the same as it was today. Uh, and if you compare that with football, for example, which has all sorts of clever graphics and and inf information, particularly at half time, I feel that the TV coverage of the tour and cycling in general could give so much more information than it does. Um, just two two examples. I'm sure you can think of more. One, when they're on climbs, can we not see the incline? 
can we not see, because it's very hard to see from TV, are they on a 6%, are they on a 15%? Surely that's not too hard. And the other suggestion is sprint finishes. You can't see anything with a long, with a camera shooting face on to the sprinters. You can't tell what position they're in. What about a split screen with an overhead shot? Okay, that's just two of my suggestions. Keep up the great work, loving it so far. Cheers. Yeah, I take the point. I think that uh, there was a lot of excitement maybe two or three years ago about the, uh, you know, the fact that data was coming. We were going to see how fast individual riders were going and what heart rate um, and what power output um, and so on. But I think we've kind of realised that the information just shown barely on the screen, um, it lacks context really. And sometimes it can be quite sort of random, the stuff that they see. I mean, the one that always sticks in my mind is when, you know, the the, the break is on the climb and it says they're going at 16 kilometers an hour and the bunch is on the, in the valley and they're going at 55 kilometers an hour. And it's like, well, what's that really telling us? It tells us that they go a lot quicker on the, on the <laughs> you know, on the, on the flat than they do on the climb. So I think the sort of selection of that data is um, one thing. I can't remember which sports director it was now who told me in the week uh, that the relying on the data that you get on the TV for your race tactics is absolutely pointless because w even with 4G or whatever, you can be on a two, three minute lag. So, um, you know, the data that's on the screen, how accurate really is it? You know, what what is it we're actually seeing? So, so you can say to the rider, attack, and he says, attack two minutes ago. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I mean... <laughs> That's, yeah, uh, Neil, Neil Stevens, I talked to Neil Stevens on the World Tag a couple of years back, and he was saying, and I, I was telling him, what, what do you tell the, 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 you know, your riders in the climbs, and when did you tell them to attack? He says, I don't say anything. I said, why is that? Because by the time I tell them something, they've done it already, you know? Mm. So, yeah, as you say, I mean, there, there's been this attempt, I remember, I mean, all sorts of comp companies uh, have been trying to, to put data, uh, you know, Okay, well, I'm not going to cite any anyone I don't want to make, but I, I, covering the Quebec and Montreal Grand Prix every year, I mean, the, the guys in charge of this were also coming for Formula One, was were also trying to put data. But what, what's what's interesting in the end, there's another very in interesting thing. You, you might ask yourself, because that would be the most important data, is how come... The, you know, we don't know who, uh, precisely, uh, we were mentioning sprints, who is at, you know, where at, at, at any given moment during the race. How come they don't have like GPS chips, you know, on their on their bikes or their jersey? And then with satellites, you, you could you could know it precisely where every rider is. But this the, is the thing: the technology it's not precise yeah, enough. When you have on your phone the problem, a GPS the, yeah. location, it says accurate to yeah. 24 meters. You think that's, oh, that's right. pretty good if it, you're trying to find someone in a bar. But if you're in the peloton, that, I mean, that's absolutely that's pointless. The, that's, you could the, yeah, be that's the answer. I mean, the answer is on, when a, a, a bunch sprints. And you, you you might think well it should be simple everybody's got a you know GPS uh, position so we know exactly who won who was second and third it doesn't work like like this because there there's interferences between the but the chips that tried that before it just doesn't work so maybe it'll be more relevant in in ten years time but not but yet. Kieran makes a very good point about the TV coverage not changing over time mm. and there that is a problem uh, and I just think it's a, a question of the size of of the audience I think if the cycling audience was was significantly bigger. Um, and TV companies like Sky or somebody else w was investing, was prepared to invest a lot of money in it, mm. it would probably change. Like, you know, in football, you've got player cam and, and so on. It's difficult to do that in cycling. And there are limitations, obviously, of a, a moving thing happening on an mm. open road. I take the point about the sprint finishes. You know, it is sometimes mm. difficult depending on the angle of the camera. And an overhead would be fantastic. And, of course, you get the overhead um, shot afterwards. I'm not quite sure well, why you don't get that. One at some point, you know, drones flying over the peloton the, the and picking out individual riders. The, the, the problem, the problem is, as far as I know, is you, you well, you, you, you can't have a moving camera on top of the of the the last two hundred meters moving like like you have in tennis or wherever, for, because, because it would be much too expensive to set up. You 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 actually have a, a um, how do you, how do you call that? Uh, you know, a, a camera standing on top of the. Uh, on a on a big arm, on yeah, a on a big arm, yeah. But but it 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 just moves. That I mean, the the problem is the uh, the production of 
the tour coverage is probably cost 10 times as much as covering a football match mm. because you, you're moving all the time over 250 k's with motorcycles you need a pl you need two planes as relays you need helicopters and the, the only way to shoot a, a, a sprint from you know from the the 500 meters to the to the finish would be a helicopter but the riders wouldn't accept that because helicopters disturb the race you know if they're too close so i'm not saying it's unfeasible i'm saying it would be very costly and very heavy in terms of logistics in uh, a, a few years ago the innovation of having the side on camera on the champs elysees sprint and that kind of it was quite kind of interesting but oddly you see less of the actual sprint from that side on angle than you do if you can see the whole width of the road but as you say francois it's the cost of covering um a day on the tour de france with the helicopters on the motorbikes i mean it it, it must well I, this could, I could get this wrong here, but I gather that a day's coverage of the Tour of Britain costs just under a quarter of a million pounds. Yeah, that's this. It's funny because I, I'm going to sound very uh, snobbish about it, but I, I read an interview by uh, um, Godard, the, uh, <laughs> the the film director, you know, a uh, very famous film, film director who was a great football fan, and, he's, and he was asked, how would you film football if you had the chance, he said, Oh, very simple. One camera, uh, you know, from where I'm standing in the stands, and I'll see it exactly how the, the spectators in the tribunes do see it. So, <laughs> yeah, that, that figure uh, from a from a TV insider, I'm, I'm quite happy to be uh, contradicted on this. But with um, planes, motorbikes, helicopters, what have you, all of the outside broadcast stuff, and and uh, you know, staff and so on, you, you for the tour of Britain, you'd be talking quarter of a million pounds. Um, extraordinary cost of covering. Uh, a bike race. A community around the world, stories and films with the most compelling characters, the world's finest apparel, explore the world of cycling with Rafa. Hi, it's Fleck from Rafa. At Rafa, we believe that cycling transforms lives and that cycling is the answer to many of our daily problems and challenges. For me, it gives me the headspace to think about the people dearest to me and focus on the most important things in life. It's amazing where your mind goes when you give it time to wonder. We have 23 Rafa clubhouses around the world with 300 rides a week with thousands of people. So wherever you are, we invite you to ride with us. Head to rafa.cc to find a ride near you. Thank you very much to Rafa, our headline sponsor. We're very grateful to them for their support. And uh, you can follow the Tour de France, as you heard there, by riding your bike with Rafa or going to one of their clubhouses around the world to watch the Tour de France. They have also produced, uh, I think, one or two uh, editions of Race Radio, their video series. Lionel, I think you met the people from Race Radio on Arp Duet, did you not? I did. They were on Dutch Corner, um, as was I. I left before uh, the race actually came past, but I think they were staying to um, to film the race or, or be there when the race came past. So you'll find that on YouTube or uh, at rafa.cc. Uh, let's plough on with our next question. This is from Joe. Hi, Cycling Podcast. This is Joe from London here. Keep up the good work out in France. Really enjoying the daily podcast. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the behaviour from some of the fans' row side, directed towards Chris Froome and Team Sky. I appreciate I'm probably slightly biased here, being a Brit and a, and a Team Sky fan. I find it slightly hypocritical that they boo, they push and they throw liquid at Chris Froome and Team Sky, despite the fact he's now been proven innocent. Yet riders such as Alejandro Valverde, that have received doping bans in the past, get away unscathed. What do you think about this hypocrisy and do you think Team Sky get a, uh, a rough ride? Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. One for Francois there, I think. It's a very tricky one. I mean, you know, the the, uh, the hostility of the public uh, on the Tour de France has always been a part of the tour. You know, they 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 the booze uh, have been part of the tour since 1904. I mean, in 1904, uh, actually, guys from Nîmes, I remember, which, which Alessandro Valverde was right. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. In 1904, I mean, guy, guys stopped uh, you know the the race and 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 shot guns, uh, you know, at, at the riders because the, the local rider, a guy named Payan, he had been, he had been, you know, uh, disqualified by the organizers. So he, they, they were, uh, you know, the local fans in Nîmes, they were not happy about that. And they, 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 you know, they stopped some of the riders and beat them up. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's part of the, uh, the Tour de France tradition. It's nothing new. I remember 
Eddie Merckx was punched in the face. I mean, th th there's always been, uh, it, it's, it's in inevitable in, in a race that's so close, in a sporting event that's so close to the, to the actors of, the, of the, the thing that there might be uh, problems. But uh, why Team Sky and, and, and not uh, the others? First of all, because they win, because you remember the public on the side of the road, uh, you know, usually they, they, what they want is actually, they, they want, uh, you know, they want to, a, a kind of tense, uh, very disputed uh, contest. They don't like it when it, it seems easy. So, so when you have uh, someone like Eddie Merckx or Lance Armstrong in the day, and now Team Sky, uh, you know, dominating too outrageously, and they, they they feel cheated in a way. So, so that's that that that's one of the reasons. Obviously, one of the other reasons that there's always been an old Anglo-French feud. I mean, I'm thinking rugby there or, or other sports. So that it adds to the to the thing, and 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 of course the 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 the, the doping allegations that have been around for 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 a long time now. Uh, if if you put them all together, wh why is not Alain Alejandro Valverde uh, booed on the side of the road? Because he's not leading the tour. He's never won it, and he'll never win it. So if you add the winning factor, the, the Anglo-French feud, the uh, the doping allegations and this tradition of uh, you know Tour de France uh, hostility towards the the actors of uh, I think you get a fair uh, quite a fair answer to your question hi chaps uh, this is Joe from Aylesbury UK um, I'm wondering what what do you uh, think of Mikel Lander's chances uh, this year at the tour Thank you, Joe, for that question. Mikel Landa, well, um, oh, we were all very curious to see how Mikel Landa would get on moving teams and, and not. There was a feeling last year at the Tour that he was, we weren't seeing the best of Mikel Landa because he was riding for Team Sky. Um, but it's interesting, isn't it, when somebody has the opportunity to uh, to, to go f to fly on their own. Uh, and I'm thinking there of Jean-Francois Bernard, who used that, that very sort of metaphor to describe how he felt when Bernardino retired and, and he had the opportunity to lead a team and, and it was difficult. Now, Mikel Landa isn't really leading his team here, although you could argue that he is now because he's the best placed of the, the three Movistar riders. And it isn't, it isn't so easy. I feel that in this final week, we will see a better Mikel Landa than we've seen so far because I think the, the crash that he had on, on the Roubaix stage was heavy. He will have, he will have been hurt there and, and I think he's been recovering from that. But whether we'll see the Mikelanda that we thought we might have seen last year at the Tour this year, I, I really don't know. No, well, going into the Pyrenees, obviously he's, he's going to be looking to try and win a stage or gain some time, but it's a long, uh, it's a big gap between him and the Team Sky riders who are first and second. Um, so I think probably podium is about the best he could hope for now, or a stage win. And that's, that's even a stage win is going to be tricky because he'll have to win a stage out of the GC group, most likely, because they're not going to let him go up the road. In terms of car career, I mean, Mikel Landa might have might seem to have made the wrong choices. You know, he was with Astana. He was in contention with, with other riders at the time, Jakob Fuglsang and others. And that he went to Team Sky. He was the most powerful team in the world, but he was number three or four in the team, so, you know, not good enough. Then he went to Movistar, and once again, there are, th there are th three leaders there. But it's, ki it's kind of a, an impossible uh, task to find the right team for him because if you want to win the tour or win a grand tour you, you must be in one of the best and the most strongest teams but in in, in, in but if you do you, you're bound to have a you know rival GC leader in the team as well so uh, what's the solution I th I'm not sure Mikel Landa will ever find it what music do you actually play in the cycling podcast team car I'm guessing Amaretta and 13 senses figure strongly but is there room for other groups or singers and is it only Walter or Taylor Swift and Beyonce when Daniel's with you? This is Beth from Cambridge. Well, Radio Richard often plays in the cycling podcast car, and I do pull his leg about this, um, but I'm quite happy with that. It's quite mellow stuff, isn't it? What have we had this last few days? Wild Beasts and Sigur Ross and uh, Mid Lake. Um, any kind of um, any kind of wailing female vocalist. <laughs> Really? Uh, we spent a whole tour playing Jana Newsom a few years ago when I was we traveling did. with Daniel Freib as well. Yeah, well, I, I, the, and I went home and then got all of Joanna Newsom's stuff 
on Spotify or whatever. I mean, maybe even purchased it. I don't know. It, how, it was a few years ago now. And it just didn't sound the same at home. I don't think I ever listened to it at home. It was just something that became synonymous with the, with the Tour de France. But we listen to quite a few podcasts as well, don't we? Mm, we do. Um, no cycling ones, though, really. Uh, we don't really <laughs> listen to the cycling ones. We listen uh, to the controversial Lance Armstrong a couple of times. Yeah. Um, yeah. But Malcolm Gladwell's podcast, Radio Lab is one that I like a lot. Um, there's, there's loads of good ones out there. We listened to a bit of ESPN's 30 for 30 as well, didn't yes, we? Yes, yes. Um, I always feel we should be you know, asking Francois what he wants us to, because Francois is a real musician among us. The, the thing is, I, I, my, my tastes are so varied that, you know, in, in a way, I, I, I like most of, you know, I have, you know, more or less the same the same taste as you have, Richard, in a way. But I, I, it's funny because I made my, well, I, I'm pulling your leg a little bit there. But I made my the, the reflection to myself the other day is you, what you're listening to is is very forty year old white male music because uh, I'm into I'm into soul music and R and B and and you know black music a lot and then we very rarely hear uh, my, my black music. I've on, been on accused the, the of having quite a narrow, quite narrow taste. Tor- tortured students' um, music, I think. Yeah, I'm really moved on, have I? Yeah. Um, tortured art students' music. We've got a lot music. of Bell and Sebastian. <laughs> I, I find Bell and Sebastian I quite, love quite Sebastian. jaunty. Yeah, great we, band. You know, they were playing in Leon uh, the night before Alp Duez stage. Bell and Sebastian. And by a weird set of circumstances, I I got to know Chris Geddes, their keyboard player, who's a very keen cyclist and very into cycling. And I, when I heard they were playing in Leon, I sent him an email inviting him into our car for Alp Duez. Unfortunately, they were heading off to Spain for a festival, so they couldn't do it. But he's a very nice chap and very follows cycling very closely. And yeah. they're, they're a fantastic and band. They, yeah, they very rarely play France. And I was I was telling you before the start of the tour, I, you know, I, I never managed to catch Bill and Sebastian because they don't play France that often. And when they come to France during the Tour de France, what a shame. <laughs> Hi, Cycling Podcast. This is Thomas. Thanks for all you do. I have a question about the jerseys. I believe the UCI allows only four, but what if there was one more? What would you like to see it awarded for? Personally, I'd like to see something like um, a jersey for the highest GC in a non-world tour team or maybe a jersey for time in the break. Cheers. I really like the idea of a jersey for the rider who spent the most time off the front in a break. It it might create a bit more um, desire from teams to get in the breaks. Um, because at the moment we're kind of stuck in this pattern. The first nine days of the race, really, we saw the same three, maybe four teams going the break. And then the middle phase of the race, we see these huge breaks go. Um, it would be good if there was something up for grabs. But Thomas, Thomas, there is, a, there is another jersey up for grabs. There is a, another jersey which has become... I would say as coveted as any of the other ones. <laughs> the Pedaleur de Charme. Yes. Yeah, well, of course. Not quite official, though, is it? Not quite <laughs> official. But uh, something, maybe best French rider. Um, just, uh, oh, Francois. <laughs> Francois. <laughs> They've got that already. It's called the French champion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that, 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 that exists already. So, yeah, I was about to say Pedaleur de Charme as well. That, that does exist. And, it, 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 you know, it fulfills its, its duty quite nicely, I, I, I guess. But, yeah, uh, but what's for sure, I mean, if, if we don't want to change the rules, the UCI rules, there must be a way to reward yeah, breakaways and escapees for sure. And, uh, well, they should do something about it. it should, that, that it's very strange. The team classification, for instance, I mean, the teams look very uh, keen on, you know, on being top of that and fighting for that. But for the general public, it, it's one of the classifications that nobody really cares about. So, I don't know, m- maybe we could strip you know, the teams from there. Well, they don't have a jersey, actually, but uh, to, 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 you know, to mark that. And, and maybe uh, you know, trans- change that classification to, to something else. I don't know. Hi, guys. It's Michael Thompson here from Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, but one thing that really struck me was the number of boos and, and jeers from the crowd uh, against Team Sky. Um, I wonder at what point will a uh, kind of a critical mass be achieved where – Sky really thinks that it's it's no longer worth their while to, to sponsor the team because of all the negative publicity. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, sponsorship really is about publicity to a large extent. And if you're getting such negative press and negative sentiment in the public, I don't know how, how good it is for your brand. Um, it does worry me, and it's possibly a, a, a topic for, for conversation uh, at some point. Um, 
It is. I don't know how long their contract lasts for uh, sponsorship with Sky Team, etc. But yeah. Anyway, thanks for the great work. Cheers. This is uh, something I thought about today. Actually, we went to the Team Sky press conference this morning. Um, a pretty shambolic affair, which wasn't entirely um, due to to Team Sky. You know, they were staying in a Campanile hotel on the edge of Carcassonne. Um, there was a small area set up for a press conference. Um, there was there were loud lorries nearby doing all kinds of, of stuff. I'm not sure what, but they were doing it loudly. No microphones for no the microphones speakers. No microphones for, for, you know, Dave Brails for initially and then Chris Freeman and, and Garen Thomas. And there were far more people there than there would have been had the Jani Moscon e- event not mm-hmm. happened the night before. So um, I think that probably swelled the number of, of uh, journalists and media there. There were also members of the public there getting in the way a little bit and the, the, you know they, they should be accredited people only in that space because journalists are there to listen to the press conference and it's kind of important that they hear what's being said so it was and I, I looked at it and I thought this is you know th- th- this is a multi-million pound sponsorship uh, behind this team and it just y- you wouldn't have that in another sport now cycling is a unique sport the way that it's run and, and, and the fact that riders have to stay in hotels like that and so on and there aren't always the facilities for a perfect press conference but um, you know and, and I thought about it also in connection to the Gianni Moscon affair because he's been thrown off the, the race for you know swinging a punch at another rider and that sort of publicity as well I think is as much as the other uh, hostility towards Team Sky is the sort of thing that a sponsor must look at and go we don't want an association with that, you know, and you know, and 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 I, I the, the the handling of Gianni Moscon, the fact that here we are, you know, he's a young rider, but he, that's about four offences now on the charge sheet, and you think there's a failure of management there because uh, here's a guy who'd been brought to the tour to do a very important job, his first Tour de France, he's let himself down. <laughs> it sounds like a cliche, he's let him, his team down, but that's the sort of act that. I think endangers a sponsorship as much as as much as you know anything else. Now, obviously, an organised systematic doping program. If that was revealed, a sponsor would run a mile from that. Um, Team Sky have been able to, whether you agree with it or not, they've been able to rationalise all the suspicion, the allegations, and, and explain them away to their satisfaction anyway, mm. and and be confident that the team is riding clean and that they are producing results honestly. They're confident in that, or they wouldn't still be backing the team. But things like the Moscon affair, I think, are a different sort of threat and a, and a thing that a sponsor doesn't really want to be associated with. Well, yeah, but I th- well, I also think the company and the teams have the same mentality, and that is that victory is what counts. Being dominant, winning. You know, Sky as an organisation are exactly like that. You know, you, you can't... I know Rupert Murdoch is not, you know, is not uh, as involved, but, I mean, it, you know, the DNA of the Murdoch business empire runs through everything that they do and I, I, I think if they win pretty much anything else gets excused I think the biggest danger biggest damage rather in terms of the kind of the PR while the Tour de France is still going on is more or less everything Dave Brailsford said in that press conference because it was pouring oil on um, if not flames then oil on coal certainly you know uh, turning this into a Team Sky versus the French um, it's it's so lame. I mean, it, it it doesn't stand up to scrutiny. It's not smart. It, it's pretty um, reductive. I I don't know what's going through his mind there. If if he's thinking I'll draw away the fire from this two you know potential two man battle between Geraint Thomas and Chris Froome, he did it in possibly the worst way he could have done. I just think yeah, it, it wasn't. It wasn't as clever as perhaps he maybe maybe he does think that was a clever strategy. And let, let, let's not forget one thing: Sky, <laughs> but nobody in France watches Sky. There's no French uh, uh, attention at all to Sky. Nobody in France knows really what Sky is. I mean, you know, it's it's a, it's an English, it's a British, uh, you know, TV uh, network, and and the, the the only people watching Sky in France are, are British expats. So, I mean, the boos from the French public have no negative uh, uh, effect whatsoever on on Team Sky as as a company because we we you know the the, the guys who boo Sky don't 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 have a clue what Sky. And secondly, that's a very interesting thing. We, we, we hear these boos and oh, the hostility of the French public.
public, but in the, in the in the media for the past year, you know, I was reading the British press and the English press about Team Sky almost every week. You had revelations and uh, you know sc scandals and questions being asked. There was nothing at all in the French press. Nobody cared about the TUE uh, stories and the Jiffy. But ask ask a, a guy in the, the Tour de France crowd about the Jiffy Bradley Wiggins Jiffy bag. I think one percent maybe of the die-hard fans of cycling would know what you're talking about. So it's very strange. I mean, I, I don't think, I think that for the image of Team Sky, the, those uh, stories are, are more, more damaging for the sponsor than the booze on the Tour de France. I think the booze on the Tour de France are more to do with the Chris Froome Salbutamol case, which mm. was concluded not to everybody's satisfaction before the Tour. I think that's a, a case that people think that they understand, even if they only have a casual knowledge. I mean, we I mentioned this earlier, but we spoke, stayed with friends of yours the other night, Francois, who are not diehard cycling fans, and, and they they had absorbed enough from the media to understand that there was this case against Chris Froome, and there's you know, no smoke without fire, etc., etc. Um, you know, that's w w what you hear. I think what Dave Brilsford, I think Dave Brilsford made a big mistake this morning, um, as he did in 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 when in his criticism of David Lapartion, he drew this caricature of him as a as a small town French mayor. When actually, what he should have done was be very specific in his complaints mm -hmm. about David Lapartion and the way that he'd handled that case and some of the things he'd said once the case had been resolved. And it's similarly here, rather than you know paint a whole country as being at fault, be specific. You mm -hmm. know, if ASO have failed in in their duty as as he thinks it, say so. Say exactly what they've done. Um, if if the UCI have failed in their duty to protect an athlete who has been cleared of, of doping and actually there never was a doping case against them, mm. then say that, be specific. And I think there is a case to be made that in their actions on the eve of the tour ASO to have Chris Froome, you know, barred from riding the tour when they knew that the case was about to be resolved. And in La Partion, in some of the things that La Partion said once the case had been closed, I think those are legitimate um, complaints that Dave Brailsford could make. Especially as this kind of chimes back to the Lance Armstrong tactic of making it against, uh, you know, about American versus the French. I mean, Armstrong's seven-year reign at the Tour de France um, spanned quite a tricky time for French American relations because obviously there was a September the 11th attack in on New York in uh, 2001 and then the invasion of Iraq and the French were kind of on the other they were exercising caution in terms of military action and and the the Americans called freedom fries they mm -hmm. wanted to call them freedom fries into the French fries they called the French cheese eating surrender monkeys Francois you must remember you must yeah, remember but, 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 all that yeah, well and, and and Armstrong kind of tapped into mm -hmm, that and right. and it, it did that, make them unpopular that, 2002 and three of course that, 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 well maybe that's maybe that's why uh, maybe I mean in in a way, Dave, Dave Bryce's comments uh, are actually very good PR for Team Sky because frog bashing has always been a, a way to, you know, put the frog bashing uh, <laughs> headline in, in, in a tabloid newspaper and you, and you sell copy you know no so frog bashing on the cycling podcast no, so no, 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 no but no. In, in it's so it's so reductive isn't it especially with brexit going on and everything it's like this, this is a i just thought it's that also was from dave brailsford this point because he is a francophile yeah you know he he actually loves this country and he speaks very good french and and he his father lives here and so and, and he's and we're all doing it we're all we all love cycling because we love the tour de france you mm. know nobody loves cycling and doesn't love the tour de france it's everybody's entry into the sport so but to it's, say it's, but to say ludicrous. to actually say well you could have a tour de france just for french teams i would love i'd love aso to say yeah okay great next year you're all you're, you're barred i mean you know if you if you're going to make that ridiculous claim well let's have it returned back with some interest because then learn learn the consequences of words in in these kind of situations instead of as just a glib kind of throwaway line that's going to get a load of but, hot but air and right. coverage maybe you were right maybe <sighs> the intention was to make tomorrow's stories about that rather than about Garrett thomas and chris yeah Froome. but Garrett thomas and chris Froome are the riders who've got to ride over all the pyrenean climbs in front of not just french fans and this is the other thing they were booing plenty on Dutch Corner. It's, it's not just the French. It's an international, it's international thing. Everyone yeah. hates them. <laughs> the cycling podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you to Science in Sport for supporting the cycling podcast. Um, you can get 25% off your Science in Sport stuff at scienceinsport.com with the code SISCP25. That's SISCP25. CP25. Let's have another question. 
Hi, it's Carl here. Uh, love the cycling podcast. I wanted to ask you a bit of a technical question. Looking back at all the years you've been doing the um, podcast, I've been listening to them for a few years now, back to maybe 2014. Um, difficult question here. I hope you can answer it honestly, but um, what's the best restaurant you've eaten at? What did you have? And which wine did you have with it? I'd be really interested to know that answer. Well, Carl, that's a great question and a, a very difficult one to answer, especially, I would think, for Francois, who, I mean, I don't want to, you know, r- reveal your age or anything, Francois, but if you were to add up the number of meals you've had on the tour, Oof. that's a lot That's a lot of food, isn't it? Yeah, that's a lot of food because I, you know, well, nearly 30 tours and so that's about, uh, <laughs> well, 20, 20, well, let's it, even put it down to 20 days, it's what, 600 days or 600 different restaurants, not always different but some of them do you have a, a best do you have a favorite yeah sure i mean the, the, for me actually it's a very simple question to answer because there's a place uh that that, that actually we discovered on tour the france uh in the well i think the very uh well late 90s or very early noughties and um that's called the viscos and it's uh in, in a little village in the pyrenees called saint savin uh it's a great place with a little abbatial church and uh, near Argelès Gazos, very close to Argelès Gazos, not far from Lourdes. And one day we were going down from the Tourmalet late, as we always often do, thinking we were not going to have dinner. I mean, this is one of the big scares of covering the tour. And we had a friend, uh, Thierry Cazeneuve, who was actually the, the, the guy in charge of the Dauphiné race. And he was uh, a gourmet, to say the least. And uh, and he said, well, listen, guys, I've seen, I've spotted this little uh, restaurant not far from here, the, down the Tourmalet, uh, in the Michelin uh, Guide, because at the time, no internet or very little internet. And so he said, we're, we're going down now. Uh, he was being driven by Charlie Motte at the time. And so, and we, we booked a table for six and, and, and uh, you know, join us there. And he was, and he was a, incredible discovery the uh, the food is absolutely uh, excellent the, the the staff are so very nice and it's become quite of a, uh, with time it's become quite a kind of a yeah a rendezvous for for cyclists and tour lovers i mean one one of the the, the guy who owns it jean pierre saint martin is a, well he, he has the bulk of of gripe a little bit more so <laughs> i mean uh, you know he's, he's got a collection of chins as well so yeah, i mean which is quite <laughs> comforting when you go to a restaurant but one of his <laughs> what was of, of his son was a is a keen rider so i mean they, they, and lots of cyclists go there even in the off season because it's done from the tourmalet the food is just absolutely stunning the first thing we had was and it's still uh, one of the, the, the place's favorite dishes. Is it, It's been passed on from generation to generation. It's a, an, an apple, you know, baked uh, in, the, in the oven, and it's stuffed with black pudding from the local, you know, pork, and foie gras. Uh, oh. And this oh. is absolutely, absolutely uh, 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 unbelievable. Another thing is called tastu. I don't exactly know what's in there, but it's pork and and uh, and a little bit of duck. Uh, it's very, very, very <laughs> high cholesterol stuff, but it's absolutely amazing. They've got lots of this, and they, they also uh, the, the new chef was the son of Jean Pierre Saint Martin, Alexis. He's a specialist of. Uh, was, uh, you know, a piece of pork called presse de porc that is very, very tender, and you 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 eat it, it rare. So as you can see, not not much room for um, you know low low cholesterol or uh, vegetarianism. Even but but don't get me wrong. I mean, they they do stuff. They like they they really like the veggies. No problem at all. You can have the they are so, ever so nice. It's you know it's really a great place. And look, and the good thing is will be you know. F- kind of ending the tour this year at Le Viscos because the other guys from the podcast don't know this place and I'm sure they'll, they'll become, you know, uh, members of the right. And we have two nights there. We have two nights oh, there. Wow, yeah. wow. I think the, the the joy for me has been over the years, the unexpected meal that suddenly comes out of nowhere when you're fearing the worst. And we had exactly that experience up in the Vendée um, on a Sunday evening, everywhere... Monday. No, Monday, it Monday was evening, wasn't it? Time trial, wasn't That's it? right. It was Monday evening because on the Sunday we'd eaten in a, a little pizzeria, crepery. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I had a pizza. You guys had a crepe, I think. And um, we really just sort of ducked under the 
uh, Indiana Jones style. We we managed to get in rolled before under. they yeah rolled under to get in, and they they guaranteed they'd serve us. But we it was a very late meal and a quite a long wait. On the Monday, I think they were pretty scarred by that. Uh, Sunday night and they were closed on the Monday and we were in a remote area and there was nothing around and uh, we were looking on TripAdvisor and Francois tried a couple of restaurants uh, no nothing doing we ended up at a pizza we're machine from village to village and the villages were just closed there was everything was closed going on yeah and we, we found a pizza well, hut well, I found a pizza machine not found, a pizza yeah, hut but, but we didn't know we were going to end up at pizza machine I mean, we were following our TripAdvisor rated mm. this is a problem with TripAdvisor um, pizzeria and it was pizzeria was a machine it was a shed like a garden sh- a big luxury garden shed with a with a pizza oven in it and uh, you put your money in or your card in and then you get a pizza out in three minutes now Francois got out of the car quite excited about this um, thinking well let's see what it's like came back to the car um, yeah I think these are pretty good uh, let's <laughs> let's try them but but in the meantime we'd also found a restaurant another maybe 15 minutes away and it was called Le Kilbus and it was in Clisson and honestly I mean it was probably the meal of the tour so it's far. so funny though driving there because remember the road was closed that's so right w- it's 15 minutes away and we're barreling along the road and we come to a big in the middle of nowhere there's nothing going on there's nothing there <laughs> and there's a, a barrier down saying road closed um obviously we 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 took we francois's advice through. on we that and we through. ignored the fine. sign <laughs> and we drove on and we got there and wow was it worth it what it, it and, was and it was really enjoyable as well because we had I mean, we'd we'd sort of, but this this place was this place was dinner. run by young people. Mm-hmm. It was um, it, the the interior decoration had been thought about cle- clearly. The menu was quite short, but you know maybe three starters, three main courses, yeah, three m- desserts. Most of the stuff was organic. The the wine list was very clever. I mean, you, they knew what they were doing. Yeah, and I had a, a cold vegetable soup, which was absolutely hit the spot after a hot day, followed by, um, well, a, a loin of pork that was cooked rare. Um, absolutely delicious. Le Kilbus. Le Kilbus. But in, uh, my, um, I, I, it's a cliche now that my, my fondness for cassoulet, which stems back to my childhood, really. I ate cassoulet cooked by my dad well before I'd ever had it in France. Um, uh, but uh, we're in Carcassonne now and uh, had a good a good eight out of ten cassoulet last night, possibly have another one this evening. But I enjoy the the kind of, if I'm in the Alps, I do like to have raclette or tartiflette. Um, the, the controversy over the bourg-en-bresse chicken still rages, but the first time I ever had this was a real sensation. I mean, it was a, it's in the Hotel de France in bourg-en-bresse where mm-hmm. ASO always stay. So, um, you know, you think, well, the, the food here will be pretty good. And you get this sort of big, corn-fed chicken leg, very yellow um, flesh with a lovely gravy and mashed potato, and it's really good. And I raved about this, but it is expensive. And um, we, we went once, and I think we got the sort of the... They gave... It, it was sort of half past ten when we got there, and they gave us the very small leftover chicken legs. And it, it was a... It was a dis- I, I, I got a lot of flack for that. You were fuming. Like I was fuming. fuming. Anyway, we should wrap things up. My mouth's watering now, and it's, mm. it's almost time for dinner. Thank you very much, Francois. Thank you. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. (laughs) 